Well, uh, so uh, I think uh, Pavel Krupa needs no introduction, but I'll try to make one anyway. Uh, Pavel Krupa is world famous for his work on not only on one subject, but on many subjects, including, of course, the IMF, uh, and, uh, a topic on which he is one of the most influential researchers. But he's also uh, uh, done, he has also done a lot of work on uh, issues like, for example, challenges to dark matter, and in particular, uh, the challenge from Mondian gravity uh, to dark matter. And of course, he's also working on cluster formation. One topic for uh, which I consider a piece of history, of scientific history, is his, de his debate with Simon White on YouTube on the topic of modified gravity versus dark matter. I, I enjoyed that very much. I recommend it to anyone who hasn't looked at it. Uh, and one thing that I uh, really uh, like about Pavel's research is that he likes to challenge apparently well-established paradigms. And I think that's something that's, uh, uh, that takes a lot of courage, uh, a lot of determination. And it also uh, is what I consider a very uh, motivating way of doing science and just looking for what can be done better than has been done in the past. So I respect that very much and I, I, I really like the, that approach, uh, Pavel. So, but today he's going to talk to us about some of the work he has done on cluster evolution. Uh, and so, Pavel, please, and we're very happy to have, with, have you here with us. Well, thank you so much. And, uh... Thank you for the um, for the opportunity to present this material to this uh, uh, audience um, and um, um, concerning challenging uh, established ideas is just a, an issue of data, right? So um, one looks at data and um, if they uh, tell us or me something which I think is different, then one goes for it. So it's I just like to, to to sort of point out that it's not like I it's it's a game to challenge, but it's just a data issue, right? So um, yeah, if there's no dark matter, then that's because of the, the data tell us there's no dark matter. It's not some <laughs> personal um, um, preference. Okay, so early star cluster evolution. Um, um, so let me uh, begin um, with Orion. If you look at the Orion um, <clears throat> uh, constellation of the sky, we, we see here the belt of Orion and the sword of Orion. In the center of the sword of Orion is um, the Orion uh, M M M42. So it's an emission nebula. And within that is the Orion Nebula Cluster. This region is the closest one, which is making ionizing stars. It's about 550 parsecs away from us. And now I'm going to um, talk about this object. So that's why I'm introducing it a little bit uh, more in detail. Um, if we zoom in on it, we can see the center of it, which has um, um, a dimension of about 0 0.05 parsecs. And these are the current ionizing stars right at the center of the cluster. We'll see to what we only see just here. Um, and thousands of stars surrounding it of, of lower mass. Now, the thing is that this cluster is already, has a very clear um, a core um, halo structure, if you like. Um, it's very compact, uh, quite round, and uh, one million years old. Um, this very center you can see here um, of the Hubble Space Telescope um, um, makes quite clear which effect this one ionizing star, Theta 1 Orionis C, which is something like uh, 50 or so solar masses, uh, what, what effect it has on the uh, stars which are themselves still very young and have still some circumstellar material around them from which they are forming. And we can see that these are like comets, and these tails are uh, photoionizing trails, which uh, are being evaporated from these objects, which are still in the process of forming through this action of, of this one star. It's, this is the main dominant ionizing uh, source. If we look a bit sideways, we can see um, um, in this Orion Nebula cluster these proplets. We zoom in on these, um, one can beautifully see uh, the in inner structure. Um, so the circumstellar disk, uh, protoplanetary disks, which most likely are now forming planets, um, and uh, then still the remnants of the um, little cloud uh, core, which actually made this uh, a star, from which the star accreted material, um, with this uh, bow shock uh, here, and and so on. So um, this is the idea we have about the Orion Nebula cluster. It's a um, 
so this is the molecular cloud. The observer is down here looking through this um, lid, molecular cloud lid and dust lids, which so, so the cluster is still partially um, obscured. But this cluster is excavated, um, part of this molecular cloud. It's a champagne flow and material is flowing out here with a high velocity. And, and this um, photoionizing region here is um, advancing into the clouds, um, presumably quite rapidly. I would just see a snapshot, but this is a very dynamic uh, structure. Um, and um, this is here from the work of Hillenbrand and Hartmann in 1998, which established that there are thousands of very young stars in this vicinity, and the central density is nearly 100,000 stars per cubic parsec, right in the middle here. You can see it's very compact. The radius is of the order of a half a parsec. Um, it expand, extends to something like two parsecs, of course. And um, uh, this inner region of 0.65 times 0.65 parsecs contains um, about 700 systems. Systems, because many of these stars are, of course, binaries. Um, we know it's youth from HR diagrams. So here's the log of the luminosity um, versus a, a log of the effective temperature, the standard um, uh, um, thing one does. And this is the work from Lynn Hillenbrand, who actually took spect spectra of these thousands of sources uh, to establish their position in, in this HR diagram and thus to um, better estimate the ages of these stars. And we can see that they cluster around an isochron of about 1 million years, but there is some substantial um, evidence for um, an age spread, which of course could also be partially due to measurement uncertainties and also variability. Um, so um, the main sequence of stars is down here. Uh, thus, we can see that in the Orion Nebula cluster, we um, see stars from the hydrogen burning mass limit, which is down here. So that's about these stars here. Um, and even below, so brown dwarfs, up to uh, the very massive stars, which um, are the ionizing stars, which are uh, beyond the graph here. And so we have a, a unique object here where we have a snapshot where we can hope to an, uh, get an estimate of the IMF. We then have clusters like the Pleiades cluster, which today has something like about a thousand stars still in it. It has an age of about 100, mil 100 million years, and the question is, how was it born? Um, we then have objects like NGC 3603, which has something like 10,000 stars, an age of about 2 million years, and being very compact, round, and well-defined in terms of a core and um, uh, body or halo structures you can see here. And then the R136 and the LMC is a order of magnitude more massive, but that's something like 100,000 stars an age of about 2 million years. And again, you can see extremely compact, round, and uh, well-defined, and free of gas already, it seems. Um, and so um, having observed such uh, observational data for such uh, uh, star clusters ranging from um, about 1,000 to 100,000 solar masses, all of which are just about a million years or 2 million years old, we can address um, their initial state, or how did they actually assemble? Yeah, so um, I'd like to spend a few minutes just on some methods to study star cluster formation. There's some sort of, there's basically two approaches which one can name. So first of all, uh, mentioning um, that basically all stars form as binaries in embedded clusters ranging from 10 to about a million or more solar masses. So in the Milky Way, the maximum mass cluster forming today is not much more than 100,000 solar masses, maybe even less. Um, now, uh, binaries because of angular momentum conservation. Right? Triples, no, because um, they would break up within 10,000 years. And we would, don't, we would not see the high binary fraction in populations which are about 1 million years old. So most stars basically must form as binaries or high reciprocal high order systems, and they form in embedded clusters. Now, um, these low mass objects are, of course, common. Taurus Auriga is only about uh, 100 parsecs from us. These objects are extremely rare. Here, we have to go extra galactic to see such star forming regions. Um, now, um, since um, stars form in these embedded clusters, it is correct to say that embedded clusters are the fundamental building blocks of galaxies. And this has major implications for calculating the properties of stellar populations in galaxies. 
Now, um, the methods to study star cluster formation are overall twofold. The one are the hydrodynamic simulations of molecular clouds with self-gravity and perhaps B fields, magnetic fields. Now, um, this uh, means that one starts in the computer with a gaseous uh, cloud, with a gas cloud, uh, which then is allowed to contract under self-gravity and form stars which end up uh, being in some sort of embedded cluster or clusterings. Um, now, this, of course, need, needs hydrodynamics, and the embedded cluster would then be treated, hopefully, with some sort of n-body code, because the gas, which is hydrodynamics, um, uh, transforms into individual particles, which then have to be treated with the n-body me method. Now, the hydrodynamics is CPU demanding. The n-body in this type of approach is usually not good. And the, the reason I'm saying that is because in order to um, calculate how a, such a star cluster evolves, once it is made of stars, one needs very precise methods of calculating the close encounters between stars. So typically, because of the CPU demand, one can only study um, embedded clusters which are not much more massive than a thousand stars. It's just a, a CPU uh, limit. And only few simulations are possible because it takes very long to do such simulations. Um, now, um, the question then is, can one do parameter scans? And basically, no. You do one calculation, might take a month if you have a really high resolution calculation, and so you can't actually do a parameter survey where you investigate 100 uh, different versions of combinations of parameters. However, such calculations give us very valuable insights into the physics of star formation, of course. And here's, for example, from your uh, own institute, the work of Enrique uh, and collaborators, um, which has shown, uh, this is from a recent paper, something which we actually see on the sky. This is really remarkable. So this is a cloud in the calculation uh, which evolves. Um, the time goes, is down here. So this is at the time at 19 uh, million years. Um, this is then 21 million years, 21, well, nearly 22 million years, and this is uh, 22.4 million years. So, um, yeah. And so, um, one can see nicely that the um, filament evolves, the stars emerge with time, clusters form, and the clusters can um, um, merge on this sort of scale. You can see the scale here. This is actually very realistic. You can see this. This is five parsecs. So the thickness of this filament is less than a parsec um, or of the order of a parsec. Now, this from here to there is about three million years. Again, a realistic time. So um, the other approach um, is the inverse, where we actually use n-body simulations of observed star clusters to go backwards in time. Here we can use full regularization and stellar evolution. And so here the idea is to use open or observed star clusters, we can also use global clusters, and then evolve them backwards in time. Um, backwards in time in the sense of not actually doing a backwards integration, but you start with initial conditions, do an body calculations forwards in time, compare the final outcome, see if that agrees with the observed cluster. If not, we adjust the initial conditions. Okay. So one can treat a certain gas embedded state. So we go backwards in time to infer, to infer the conditions when the cluster was extremely young in order for it to look today using the n-body method. Here we have n-body, which is usually very good, but stars in a gas potential. So the gas is treated very badly. So just as a static gas potential or a gas potential, which is changing with time to, uh, to mimic or to model the uh, expulsion of gas from the system. And um, the n-body aspect today is easy, thanks to the spare as of uh, n-body codes with uh, individual adjustments. Here we can do many models and we can go up to about a million stars. So we can do parameter scans. And that's the advantage of this particular uh, method. Although we cannot treat the really initial state, which of course we get from this type of uh, approach. So um, we can address one major question. Um, in the community, it is often discussed that these clusters like the Orion Nebula cluster or uh, R136 would be merging um, hierarchically from sub clusters. Can this work? So we have um, one observed um, uh, situation, and that is that these observed very young, basically embedded or nearly embedded clusters, which are very compact. Okay, We've seen the images from the ONC 
NG3603 and R136. Um, and actually, this is also what you see from, from this uh, from this very nice work here. Um, and um, so the question now is, do these clusters form from a monolithic molecular cloud co collapse? So basically, the cloud makes an overdensity in, uh, in gas, and that then collapses and makes the cluster, uh, more or less decoupled from what happens around it, um, except that gas could, of course, be flowing in still. Or um, do subclusters form in the molecular cloud, for example, in a turbulent uh, cloud, and these subclusters then fall together to form a cluster. So there's some elementary arguments which we can apply. We tested this. So here's a, um, a um, region of a molecular cloud in the sense of an n-body model. So you can see here this goes from, this is 12 parsecs across and 12 parsecs across. And we assume that there are all these subclusters, which and this is at one million years, are allowed to um, fall towards each other under self-gravity. After two million years, which is the age of those clusters I've shown you, the age of the observed clusters, we see this type of object. It's um, not very well defined. It's very complex in its morphology. If we uh, do the same experiment, but we allow these, these subclusters fall to, to fall together in a gas potential, they, of course, go together much more quickly. So that's why here they are actually in the process of hitting each other, while here they are not yet, although this is also at one million years. It's because the velocities are larger because of the gas potential. But then at two million years, they pass through each other and produce this uh, mass uh, at that age, which, of course, is not comparable to any of the observed clusters. In fact, none of these are comparable to any clusters. So there's a very elementary argument, which you can see in this graph. Here we have the infall time. So this is the time from the beginning until the, um, these meet, uh, like here. This is here the um, infall time for this type of object at one million years. And that corresponds about to this uh, curve here. So we see here the infall time, for example, this is two million years, and the initial dimension of the subclusters. And so we can see that the um, in order to have an infall time of um, one million years, which is about the age of the ONC, we need to start the subclusters at a, dis at a distance of uh, less than two parsecs. But remember, this is only the infall time, so the time to cross once through. Then, as we can see in these pictures here, the, the, the subclusters will still pass through each other, uh, scatter on each other, but the object is still not, does not, still doesn't have the concentrated morphology we observe. And so uh, this type of argument tells us that um, it doesn't work. Okay, how does a merging of smaller clusters to make the type of open clusters or the type of uh, very young clusters which are just already uh, void of gas, so like R136 or um, ONC, simply cannot work. Yeah? There's not enough time to, um, to, to do this. So I can now address the initial cluster radii and the expansion problem, because we've already uh, seen from the images that these clusters appear to be formed very compact. In fact, much more compact than open clusters. So the typical present day density, both size and age, and near spherical cohalo morphology of gas-free, very young, massive clusters. For example, these ones I've, seen, I've shown uh, before, here, dictate an episodic or monolithic or near monolithic formation of such star clusters undergoing a violent gas dispersal phase. So that's a statement which we made in this review. Basically, it takes too long to make these types of clusters through hierarchic emergence. So what we did in another study is to look at open clusters um, and measure the um, energy of the widest binary stars um, which still are in these clusters. And from that, we can deduce the maximum density the, density the cluster could have had in its uh, history when it was born um, so that these white binaries could survive. Because in the cluster environment, binaries interact and they dis uh, ionize each other, they disperse, right? So the longest measured binary orbits in these clusters give us an indication of the density the cluster had in the past, such as these binaries can survive. And this leads to this equation. So if this is the mass in stars, which formed in this one event, in this embedded cluster, then it must have had this radius, 
in order to observe the binaries up to this widest binary uh, star orbits, which are observed in these particular clusters. So here's a diagram. <clears throat> we did this for these clusters, like Pleiades, Presepe, um, and these other uh, objects. And the uh, interesting result here, plotted in this particular way, is the density corresponding to this radius and this mass um, versus the mass of the embedded cluster. So, for example, the Orion Nebula cluster has a birth, had a birth density very close to 100,000 solar masses per cubic parcel. The Pleiades was very close to that, actually, just at a slightly slower, lower mass than the ONC in this uh, quantification. We compared these densities with observed densities of molecular cloud cores, which are these symbols, which come from these um, um, radio observation studies here. And um, they agree remarkably. Yeah? This is really quite amazing that from these observed clusters, we get a distribution which agrees with the observed molecular cloud core densities. And these points here are global clusters calculate, so these are the initial densities of globular clusters at their birth using a very different argument. Basically, that argument rests on looking at the mass function of these globular clusters and assuming the IMF is universal, we see that in some of these clusters, they have a lack of low mass stars uh, and they have a certain radius today. So we can calculate how compact they must have had in order for the uh, energy uh, feedback from the massive stars to expel the gas sufficiently fast such that the low mass stars are lost, causing the deficit of low mass stars. And this leads to initial birth densities, which again, remarkably lie close to this best fit line, which uh, comes from these data here. So uh, this suggests a sort of universality of star cluster formation going from global clusters down to the smallest regions like Taurus Auriga we see in the nearby molecular clouds. Um, you can see that according to these calculations, the global clusters had potent potentially very high masses beyond 10 to the six solar masses, in some cases, and extreme densities beyond 10 to the seven solar masses per cubic parsec. Now, um, what do we see in molecular clouds? So these are real clouds, not the computer cloud, and they show basically what Enric already found in, in the computer. Now you can see a molecular cloud filament in Taurus. So this is the Taurus uh, region. Um, and um, the molecular cloud filament here, uh, which forms, um, is extremely compact. Yeah? It has less, the width is less than a parcel. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we have the uh, main filament which feeds materially towards a um, convergent point where the density rises and that's where stars form and there are subfilaments. And this dimension is smaller than a parsec. In fact, it's more like the width of the filament. It's compressed because as the material flows in, the potential compresses the filament. And so this is well sub parsec dimension where the embedded cluster forms, where the stars are mostly forming because that's where the density is simply higher. Um, and um, yeah, so this is very similar to what we've seen in uh, the simulations in your institute. And um, here's the cross section of the filaments. And you can see that it peaks at 0.1 parsecs. This is quite remarkable um, uh, as obtained by uh, Philippe André um, from a uh, survey of these uh, filaments. Now, remarkably, this is exactly what we got from our white binary star argument in the open clusters, it's exactly the same scale. This is truly either just a fluke coincidence or it actually is physics. Yeah. So if you put in here one solar mass, this is the sort of star you'd be forming along a filament if it's um, um, not exactly in the embedded cluster, and you get 0.1 parsecs, which is exactly the scale. So that is really truly remarkable and very encouraging. So very young star clusters are typically very compact, as we've established, um, but open star clusters, which are older than something like a few 10 million years, have typically half mass radii near three parsecs. This extends even to global clusters. They all have about three parsecs half mass radii. The size difference constrains the formation of star clusters because we can either speculate that they formed in this way and what we are seeing now is not what will later make an open cluster or we can 
argue that yes, stars form in these embedded clusters which are so compact and then they expand to the radii of the open clusters. And this is the cluster expansion problem. So here's now a simulation um, of the of star clusters which form very compact. So this is the radius, here's one parsec, this is 10 parsec, and this is the time. And if we start the clusters with N body, without gas expulsion, um, and you can see if they're so compact, they evolve, they expand because of the binary heating and because of stellar evolution mass loss. So the clusters just naturally expand slightly because of the um, mass loss from evolving stars and because the binaries uh, heat the cluster. But you can see that if they are born so compact, they cannot expand to the observed sizes of the, of the star clusters, which are here from Milky Way and a local group um, star clusters. And this here is, by the way, the, uh, the age, uh, the mass, um, I think this is the mass scale here. Um, so we can then um, look at um, the same problem, but with gas expansion. So these are the same calculations, but now we start the clusters compact. We have them embedded in class for the ultra compact H2 lifetime, which is about in these calculations 0.6 million years. Then the gas is expelled and the clusters expand because the potential suddenly flattens, the stars move out, the cluster expands, and then they revitalize depending on the mass they have on how compact they were. Now we can cover the observed um, radii of these clusters. Now this works if the clusters form from the previous radius mass relation and if they expel about 67% of the gas in terms of, um, of mass. So if the star formation efficiency is about one third, then this expansion works and we can understand the radii of the observed open or older clusters. Um, but, so the question is, sorry, I went a bit too fast. Um, the question though is, can this work? Is this realistic and is there enough feedback energy to expel so much gas from the um, clusters. So this is the star formation efficiency issue. The star formation efficiency is quantified um, in a very simple way. So this is the mass in stars divided by the mass in the whole cluster before it forms. So mass in stars plus the mass in gas at, the, uh, at any time. And that is observed to be about less than 0.4, so 30%. Here is a um, survey by uh, Magit et al. 2016 of the Orion star forming region. So this is the um, on the sky in right ascension and declination, but here expressed uh, physically nicely actually in parsecs. This is the sort of Orion. So the Orion nebula cluster is forming here. And they've discovered, the work of the team of Magit et al. have discovered that in the whole southern part of this cloud, there are as many stars forming as in this one cluster here, but they're all also clustered. And the interesting thing is that they don't form any ionizing stars, although they formed as many stars as the ONC. This immediately implies that the IMF cannot be a probability density distribution function. The northern part of the Orion star forming region again has its young stars in these embedded clusters as just one example. So all stars form clustered, i.e. we can say in embedded clusters because the stars form embedded in the gas in compact structures. They measured the star formation efficiency just by counting the number of stars and um, the amount of mass in these clusters in gas. And they found that typically these are of the order of only 10%. So here's the mass of the objects. The, or I think the Orion Nebula cluster is given by this, um, uh, by this, uh, by these points, and uh, this is the star formation efficiency. Now, uh, since these objects are still forming stars, these are lower limits, but you can see that to reach up there, you um, it does seem to be unlikely. And largely, these embedded clusters seem to be, from direct inspection, largely already established stellar populations. So it does indicate that the star formation efficiency is less than 40% and actually given the numbers more like only 10%. So 
So now the question of gas removal time scale. Assuming that we have to remove more than 50% of the gas, is there enough energy to do so? So we have the star formation efficiency as before. And um, the residual gas is removed from the cluster volume through stellar feedback over some time scale, which is the gas removal time scale. So this amount of matter, this M gas, is removed from the cluster, leaving only the stellar population. Um, and this can be fast. So relative to the crossing time through the cluster, that's basically the question we have to address. If it's fast, so if it's of the order of one or less, then it's explosive and the cluster will more or less fly apart. If it's slow, the cluster will just expand. And the crossing time through the cluster is, in this calculation, just two times the radius of the cluster divided by the velocity dispersion of the stars in the cluster. Um, so um, how red, rapidly can the gas be expelled? Well, we can look at an energy argument. Of course, uh, people like Enrique will know that this is a very primitive argument, but um, it's uh, something one can at least uh, look at. And so if we calculate the binding energy of such a cloud, so this is the gas plus stellar component squared divided by the radius, and that's the binding energy here um, expressed in terms of uh, ERG. And then the crossing time through the cluster is given by this equation in terms of um, the mass here in 100 solar mass units and parsecs, and if we assume just for the sake of argument that the um, radius is one parsec, we can make this little table and find that a star cluster, an embedded star cluster with 10 to the four solar masses has this binding energy here and a crossing time of 0.48 million years if the radius is one parsec. Of course, it will be correspondingly larger if the radius is only half a parsec and then this would be half the, uh, the, the uh, uh, length. So we can then um, go to um, look at how much um, energy a star can produce. So using old uh, numbers, but these don't really change significantly. A 15 solar mass star injects this amount of energy every 100,000 years. This includes uh, um, mechanical energy. And an 85 solar mass star injects uh, 10 times as much. So you can see if you compare this time scale with these time scales and this energy here with these energies that a star cluster like this mass, which has many such stars and potentially a few of these massive stars easily has an input of energy, which is far surpassing the binding energy of the whole structure. And the input is faster or more rapid than the crossing time. And so this suggests that in principle, there does seem to be well enough energy available to really blow the thing apart, basically. And so here are now actually observations. We have the starburst clusters in the antenna galaxies, which have radii of about four parsecs, thus about crossing times of 0.5 million years. And the, um, so this is the antenna galaxy. These are two interacting galaxies. I refuse to use the word merger because we don't know if they are merging. They are definitely interacting. So you can see this, this dot up here is one star cluster. And here you can see a, a system of star clusters sitting on top of each other. So this is a, um, a, um, a regime of star formation beyond anything we see in the local group. This is a, a huge star cluster of star clusters, but they've measured that, they, uh, that these structures are producing uh, winds um, or expanding shells of gas from these, which have about a velocity of 25 to 30 kilometers per second. And so the gas evacuation times for these structures, this here is about 100 parsecs across, by the way, is a fraction of a million years. Now, this is an even larger structure, as you can see. So this is immense, but you can see that the evacuation time scale seems to be very quick. And then we have this little cluster here, the treasure chest cluster, which is um, quite nearby uh, from this paper here. It has a radius of less than a parsec, an age which is supposedly about only 200,000 years. And it's driving an H2 region, which is expanding at a velocity of about 12 kilometers per second. So again, the gas evocation time scale from this inner, from this region here is quite rapid. 
So the examples, what I've just mentioned here, um, <clears throat> suggest that in the presence of O-stars, explosive gas expulsion may drive early cluster evolution independently of cluster mass. So it seems to be explosive, but is there other evidence? Well, we'll come to that in a moment, but let's first look at actual n-body calculations. So here we have an n-body model calculated by Holger Baumgart of an embedded cluster, which is why it's red, because it's still embedded. And then the gas is removed, but not instantly. That's it. it was just removed with 10 kilometers per second. And you can see how the cluster expands. It's lost about 67% of its gas mass. So the, that's, the star formation efficiency is about 33%. And you can see that the cluster has uh, lost a large fraction of its stars, which immediately form these tidal tails, and part of it revirilized. So it didn't actually go kaput, but uh, it, it expanded, but the inner region recollapsed, it revirilized on a certain time scale. And um, he, we can do these more detailed calculations, uh, starting um, with 10,000 stars, including brown dwarfs, 100% binaries a very compact cluster, a very large central uh, density. So this is basically a model of the Orion Nebula cluster. And this is what it looks like. So it looks a bit complicated, but what this is showing now here is the gas mass. It's one for the time when the cluster is embedded at 0.6 million years. So this is the ultra compact H2 uh, phase. It, the gas finds a way out and blows out was 10 kilometers per second, it's not instantaneous, and then it goes to zero. And these here are Lagrange radii. So this radius contains always 50% of the mass in stars of the cluster. So uh, this, is the, um, this is one parsec here, and this is about one third of a parsec. So this cluster has a half mass radius of 0.4 parsecs here, and it's stable within the um, while it's embedded. When the gas is ex expelled, it expands. So you can see the 50% Lagrange radius expands. And then at this time, which is about at, uh, one, at 10 million years, 50% of the stars cross the tidal radius of the cluster. The screen line is the tidal radius. This is the 40% Lagrange radius here. And this is the 30% Lagrange radius. So you can see that the cluster retains about 30% of its stellar mass, which then revirilizes. So it expands, it loses about uh, um, 60 um, or 70 percent of its stars, but the, in, the, the stars which are not lost, the 30 percent stop expanding and revirilize and collapse. And that's what you see in the stern over the Lagrange radius. So this 20 percent Lagrange radius expands, but then turns over, recollapses. And here we have the normal stellar evolution of the star cluster through the n-body uh, method. Um, the blue line is the core radius. That's not so important here. So um, the, remarkably, this calculation, the snapshot at 1 million years, which is nominally the age of the ONC, looks just like the Orion Nebula cluster in terms of its profile, in terms of its um, kinematical uh, structure as well as its uh, binary star population, incredibly close to the Orion Nebula cluster. If we go further and we look at the same cluster at 100 million years, which is here, we see a Pleiades in terms of the density structure, the radius, its binary star uh, uh, content, and its kinematical uh, uh, process. So we have in one go a model for the Orion Nebula cluster and a model for the Pleiades. So what this means is the following. Here's the mass of the cluster, and this is the time um, as it evolves. So if a cluster forms here with this mass, about 1,500 solar masses, and we use the classical n-body method to calculate it, it just evolves, losing stars because the stars through it lose every star cluster loses stars through the energy equipartition process. So stars, some stars just leak out of the cluster because they just gain enough energy through many multiple weak and body uh, um, gravitational encounters. So the cluster constantly evaporates stars and reduces its mass. And this, of course, is helped by stellar evolution. So if we use this classical n-body method, we would deduce for the Pleiades, which has this mass and this age, 100 million years, this birth mass. But if the Pleiades formed, as I've just described, with gas expulsion and from the compact state, 
then its real mass would be up here. And then it, um, as the gas was expelled, it lost a large fraction of its mass very quickly. And then it got onto this classical track and evolved according to uh, the energy equipartition process to the current state. So it's a bit unclear. Is this the true initial state of the Pleiades, compact and massive, much like the Orion Nebula cluster today, or is this the actual initial condition? Um, so we have this uh, uh, idea or this notion that the Orion Nebula cluster forms, it's at 1 million years, um, forms very compact. Then 100 million years, well, this is actually 99 million years later, we see the Pleiades. You see it also as a trapezium, just like the ONC, but this is 0.05 parsecs and much more massive stars, while here the, um, the dimension is about 1.5 parsecs. And of course, these are only A stars. So we have the idea that the ONC expands, it expels its gas, expands and evolves to the Pleiades. And if we do the antibody calculation further for another 500 million years, we actually get the Hyades out of this. This is completely crazy, but this is actually quite close to, 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 to what one gets in the computer. So these three objects, the Hyades cluster, the Pleiades and the ONC are basically one and the same objects just seen at different times. Now, um, so if you look at the night sky, here you can see the Orion with the, with the um, sword here, and this is the belt of Orion. Um, here's the Hyades, and here are the Pleiades. We basically see the same object nearby to us at, um, so this is at 45 parsecs approximately, this is at about 100 parsecs away from us, and this is at about 450 parsecs away from us. And it's like one and the same object, just a different snapshot. I find this quite stunning and remarkable, actually, because these are naked eye objects. Here's uh, another collation by Brandner. We have um, this NGC 3603 cluster, which is, um, so this here is the one parsec length in all of these pictures. This is the Arches cluster at a similar age. And you can see they have a very similar morphology, very compact and look very similar. If we then go to an older age, like this Westerlund one, and quintuplet cluster at an age of three to five million years, they already look expanded and not as compact. And if one goes to an even larger uh, age at seven to 12 million years, the clusters look much more expanded um, than, than these. And so you can see this collation is very nice collation in this uh, paper up here by Brandner. And recently there was this publication by Getman et al who also find evidence for an expansion um, from uh, Gaia data. So um, from modeling rapid violent expulsion of residual gas plus expansion, we have the following situation. We looked at all these objects, which are extremely well observed. These are the type of clusters where we have the best data um, and they're all extremely young, about a million years old, covering very different mass ranges from 10 to 100,000 solar masses. And it is most remarkable that only four numbers describe the evolution. And that is the, um, it's actually three numbers, sorry. Only three numbers. First of all, the star formation efficiency is only 33%. Um, the uh, gas expulsion time scale goes with 10 kilometers per second, especially the sound speed of ionized gas. And you need a delay time of about 600,000 years, which is basically the ultra compact H2 region, which actually is true for these clusters here less so for uh, the Taurus Auriga groups, of course. So we have this uh, good understanding and actually an, a rather remarkable in, uh, indication of a universal mechanism forming these uh, type of clusters. And now I come to the Orion. This is my, the last part of this talk, which shatters everything I've just said. Remember this slide, we are looking at this object, Orion Nebula cluster. And as Teresa Irapkova pointed out, since 1998 until 2018, there have been 1,752 publications on this object. One would imagine that nothing new can be found on this cluster. Well, this paper by Beccari et al., it's an ESO uh, European Southern Observatory team, discovered using small telescope, only 2.6 meter VLT survey telescope, a rather dramatic result, and that's as follows. So the idea was so far that we have star clusters form in one continuous event 
feedback of massive stars truncates star formation and destroys gas and dust. So this was what I've told you up until now um, with those three numbers. That's how one would nicely understand uh, star cluster formation. The massive stars destroy the cloud, the cluster expands, and, and the show is over, basically. But what they found, uh, the Cardi et al. found, is that in the ONC, three spatially distinct and age-separated stellar populations have been found. Shattering this and everything I've said until now. Yeah. And so here we have what they've discovered. This is the color magnitude diagram in the R band. So this is the R band magnitude versus the color R minus I. The, the, the main sequence is somewhere down here. This here is the population of young stars in the Orion Nebula cluster, and they discovered these three sequences. So if, they, if one rotates the sequence vertically, one gets these vertical lines. It's just a rotation of the sequence. And then one can make these histograms here in, in delta Ri. And one can now nicely see that there is evidence for one burst of popular uh, star formation, another burst, and a third burst. Of course, the statistics can be discussed, but um, they are confident that they are these three uh, populations. These are the properties of the populations. So the mean age of the oldest population is 2.87 million years. Of the young population, it's about 1.9 million years. And the very young population is only 1.24 million years. Interesting is that the rotation velocity of the stars in these populations match these numbers. So the youngest population had the stars moving much, uh, rotating more rapidly than the young population and the old population. So they, it looks like the stars are actually also slowing down in their spin, which they should be if they are physical, if this is a truly a physical age, which they've discovered. Spatially, you can see that the young population is most significantly concentrated. So what is, this is showing the on-sky RA right ascension versus declination image. The uh, young population is more extended and the old population is even more extended, but the centers all overlap. So they are really on top of each other. Furthermore, this, these three populations have been verified using Gaia data released to by Yarab Kova et al. So how can these results be understood in terms of the knowledge which has been built up, which I've um, reported to you before. And so, Here's a possible model. It took some time to figure this out, but actually it's a very simple model and we now know in the future have to find out if this actually is a correct description. So the idea, this is a complicated uh, description, repeated stellar dynamical termination of feedback halted filament accretion model. The idea is you have a filament, the gas flows in, stars form, the massive stars terminate star formation but eject each other and so new gas can flow in, completely simple, right? Is this actually possible? So the key may be stellar dynamical ejections. Um, and, um, and yes, uh, what we found in this paper here, where we set up very realistic, very compact clusters with all stars in binaries that at a scale of about a few thousand solar masses, the efficiency of ejecting massive stars is incredibly high, you can see that even ejecting all your ionizing stars occurs, and it occurs quite often actually, from these clusters to see it. So the massive stars form and they throw each other out of the cluster. Here are some, uh, um, here's a movie. You can see a movie of a, a star cluster with 3000 stars. All stars are in binaries. And you can see how violent this is. Look at the scale. Here. The cluster starts with 0.3 parsecs radius, and this covers 40, 60 parsecs on the sky. You can see that even the very massive stars are ejected. And you can see this particular star just from two neutron stars, which are now racing away sideways across the, uh, the, the cluster. So you can see that within a few million years, this cluster has populated the whole field spanning 60 parsecs with young stars. And here's the same calculation, now a 10 times more massive cluster. And you can see how more violent this is. This cluster is spurting out stars on a fraction of a million years and even massive stars. You see how fast some of them go.
And you can even see that massive, multiple massive stars are uh, lost from the cluster, which then evolve. They, in this particular case, actually merges. You see that the color is light blue, and then it merges, so it makes a more massive star. The color bar is the mass of the stars. So you can see that within a few million years, this cluster with 50,000 um, stars has populated a region of 90 parsecs overall, 90 times 90 parsecs, including many very massive stars. And this is consistent with the observed number of massive stars which are run away, uh, the number of D stars and A stars. These calculations show these type of numbers very, very nicely. So we have a very nice understanding of these runaway stars in terms of the dynamics of these young clusters. And also this is the case because most massive stars are of course in multiple systems. And so now this is the nearly final part. Here we have the molecular cloud filament which starts to form here in the convergent where the gas converges from the filament. It flows, falls actually towards the potential minimum because there's an overdensity. Here, the stellar population forms, including massive stars. The massive stars ionize the gas and stop star formation. So the first population forms. However, the massive stars eject each other and the cluster expands because the gas is removed by ionizing stars. Because the ionizing stars have ejected each other, and if the filament still exists, and so this ejection is to happen quickly, new gas can flow in forming a second population of stars. Again, it makes massive stars, and again, the massive stars are ejected, so that the second population expands, allowing again new material to flow in. And so um, the question is, are these ejected stars in the sky? And it is most remarkable that they have been found. So the three O stars, these cases here, are traced back to the um, Orion Nebula Cluster by Hucheverf and uh, Gualandris et al. And they've been ejected 2.5 million years from the ONC. And um, so um, I note that um, the um, prediction of these masses of these stars is near to exact if the IMF is treated as an optimally sample distribution function while the IMF is, so the IMF is not a probability distribution function. This allows us actually to predict these stars 2.5 million years in the first population which formed. Here's the uh, tracing back of the trajectories. The stars on the sky have been calculated backwards in the galactic potential so that one finds them meeting the cluster 2.5 million years ago. Okay, so um, this part actually just will skip through. We can, if we assume that all stars form in embedded clusters, um, we can, so this is an image, we can see that they form in these embedded clusters. Um, we can calculate the binary population when the clusters disperse because binaries are destroyed in the clusters. This is the IGMF theory, but applied to binaries. So we solve this integral. This integral tells is an integral over all the embedded clusters forming in a galaxy. And with this operator, we can calculate how a star cluster with this mass destroys its binary population. We know the most massive cluster from the star formation of the galaxy. So we can actually solve this integral. And this is the final plot. This is the star formation of the galaxy, and this is the half mass radius of the clusters, which we assume in these models. And this is where the Milky Way is. The Milky Way has a star formation rate of some few solar masses per year, and the embedded clusters, which we observe, are, have this radius of about 0.2 parsecs. So if we integrate over all embedded clusters in the whole galaxy, we expect the binary fraction to be about 50%, and that's shown here. This is 100% up here, and this is zero. So the Milky Way, according to this calculation, um, should have 50% binary fraction in the field. And that's actually what it has been measured to be. Now, a dwarf galaxy, which has a low star formation rate, will have a very high binary fraction in the field. In fact, of the order of 80%. 
the Milky Way has 50%, a dwarf galaxy should have about 80%. And an elliptical galaxy, which formed with a huge star formation rate, would have a binary fraction of only about 20% in the field. And so the conclusions are that small telescopes can yield big results. Um, it's quite, um, so the detailed formation of star clusters has become a much more dynamic and interesting problem. Um, it is actually incredibly beautiful how we can read off from the sky already on a star by star basis, the detailed physical sequence of star formation spanning a few million years, even down to individual stellar masses. And the prediction of this overall ansatz is that dwarf galaxies have a high field binary fraction and massive elliptical galaxies have a low field binary fraction. So thank you for uh, listening and uh, apologies for going somewhat over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, people can raise their hands if they have questions. I see uh, Rosa, do you want to go ahead? Yes, uh, thank you. So, Pavel, with this uh, very beautiful talk, uh, would this last model work for globular clusters with multiple sterile populations? Can you couple these dynamical uh, calculations with chemical calculations to see if, if also you get the right chemical enrichment? In the global clusters? Yes, um, the ones so with multiple yes. stellar populations. Mm -hmm. So the global, um, the, the multiple populations we see in global clusters have uh, have a very different origin. It's not this origin. So this is a, it's a very different problem. Um, the um, the uh, time difference in the Orion Nebula cluster we see of a few, a few hundred thousand years to a million years would simply not be seen anymore in global clusters, which are about you know older than ten billion years. Um, there is another um, way to explain the uh, multiple populations on, on, in global clusters, which may actually work. And that is, again, I mean, it's very related. And that, the idea there is to say that the global clusters, they start forming, the gas falls together, because this is a scale which we don't see anywhere in the um, a nearby universe now anymore. But um, the extreme densities in the centers form very massive stars, in fact, most likely a top-heavy IMF. And the binary, the massive stars will be in binaries or multiple systems simply because of angular momentum of the core. It always spins up and contracts, it typically breaks up into a number of uh, uh, protostars or stars which are forming. Now, uh, the, di the di uh, binary encounters will be shooting out the stars, but the potential is so deep that the stars will not be able to leave. They will typically go out and come back. Um, and now the, uh, but what does happen is that these many encounters between binaries harden some binaries and they merge. And so there's a huge amount of merging going on in the very young uh, global clusters simply because of the densities. And these mergers, when they come together, they expel matter, which has been processed in the stars. And this, from this matter, new stars will be forming because all of this is happening within 100,000 years or less. And so one can actually build up in pockets in the cluster where mergers happen, enriched populations um, which, uh, of stars, which then themselves start merging and form yet again enriched populations around them. And when then the, the whole thing uh, quietens down, the gas is consumed or uh, partially expelled or lost, uh, the populations of stars we would be seeing in global clusters would be a complicated mixture of uh, enriched stars from these ejecta of the merging stars um, um, in exactly the way we, we, we expect in terms of these anticorrelations. Uh, so before uh, any supernova enriched the, uh, um, the, the material. And this has been published in a, in a paper fairly recently by um, Wang, uh, myself, uh, Yerakova. Um, so if you'd like to uh, read up on that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. Uh, Enrique? Okay. Uh, well, I actually have lots of questions, but I'll ask one and then let <laughs> other people ask. Um, I guess one thing that uh, was very interesting to me was uh, your suggestion that there may be a universal mechanism for the cluster formation. I, I, I failed to catch the, the, the uh, transparency page, but... Uh, it was that plot that went all the way from globular clusters to uh, to very small uh, objects, and um, so it does. 
the question would be it, it was a plot on yeah you but no it was a plot uh, where you had you had a plot of cluster mass versus density or stellar density versus cluster mass uh -huh. yeah, let me try to find it <laughs> um, yeah. no, it's probably there yeah, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. this one mm -hmm. Exactly. And so my, my question here would be, does this line imply that there is like a fundamental parameter of the cluster that is, is sort of scale free that applies in all cases, something like uh, the, the genes mass or the number of genes masses in the cloud or something like that? Because uh, this relationship points to something like that, that like it, it would be like, what is the density that is required to form a cluster of a given mass or something like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there's still a large scatter, so it's quite possible that, you know, this um, sort of, maybe there is this sort of underlying uh, um, uh, correlation between radius and mass of the stars which finally form. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, with some variations due to local um, physical different conditions, or of course, there are major uncertainties. Maybe there is an exact such relation, um, and we see the scatter simply because of uncertainties. Um, it's quite possible that this is, in fact, uh, uh, um, indicating a, a, a actual physical uh, relation um, when um, embedded clusters form. Um, an analogy, uh, an, an, I wouldn't say that we understand it, yeah, but an analogy would be that, um, you know, if you take any particular star, it will have formed in a different environment than any other star. Uh, and the gas which makes these two different stars come from different regions of the galaxy and so on. So they were assembled somewhat differently, but they all end up exactly on the main sequence. If they have the same, exactly if they have the same chemical composition, age and rotation. Mm -hmm. And so this means that there's a physical pr principle which guarant uh, guarantees or establishes that the star has the radius and luminosity it has simply because of the uh, physics which uh, are happening, uh, which are stabilizing the gas, which actually wants to collapse. And those are, of course, the nuclear reactions in the star. Here, we might have something similar in the sense that a molecular uh, cloud um, wants to collapse, preferably if it would have its wish to a singularity. And um, what stops it, of course, is um, a lot of physics on the way, right? And so uh, it heats up, so there's this pressure. Um, and, um, and so that's maybe what actually is, is then uh, uh, making this sort of relation and interplay between, well, the, the, um, some sort of uh, pressure buildup, so on, on opacity limits, at so a point when the density becomes large enough that it can't cool anymore fast enough and the amount of matter which is falling onto it. So it stabilizes, but it's still squashed together by the uh, surrounding uh, matter which would be much more, uh, so it would actually be squashed together more before it actually, um, you know, uh, is finished making stars than this, these type of objects which um, undergo the same, same physical principle, but of course don't suffer the same uh, pressures um, or, or, or uh, uh, weight of the uh, infalling material. Uh, so this would be some sort of speculative answer I mentioned. Um, um, yeah, so um, I, I just thought, thought it's quite, what well, we found in this paper that it's remarkable that this is apparent, that's why we wanted to point it out, and I think it does um, offer a chance to do further, very nice, uh, I think, research to just follow up on this and see if there is something to it or not. What is, what is the slope of the line? Mm. So well, the density here, goes like mass to the what? Uh, well, here, that's the, uh, so, so this is the density, I don't know, I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. We'd have to look at the paper. Um, but this follows from this, you can just transform it, right? Okay. Next, uh, mm -hmm. Through divided by R cubed, right? And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. that's basically. Okay. Uh, I'll let somebody else yeah. ask a question. Uh, Roberto? Uh, hi. Uh, yes, uh, I, I also had more than one, but let's make just one question. Uh, so. What's the dependence of, of these results on, on early cluster evolution on the star formation efficiency that you set as one third? Because there is yeah. observational evidence that that can change, you know, when you go from a low mass star formation, star formation cloud to a very high mass star formation cloud, that number actually changes, uh, in particular in the, in the very massive star formation regions. Uh, 
it can be very high locally, like in the most massive hubs with a lot of action, it can be, I don't know, 50% or, or more. And probably globally, globally through the cloud, it can go, back, go, go down back again to something like 5%, 10%. So, what's that? Uh, it's 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 entirely possible. I mean, uh, so McGee is right that they have some weak evidence for an increase in the staff mission efficiency. With less, you see, there's some sort of slope here, right? I mean, I'm, I don't think it's very significant, but it's definitely indicative. And from a physical point of view, I, I agree that it's um, that it's um, that it would be it would make sense. I mean, if you have an extremely massive uh, object like. Um, these uh, clusters I was just uh, showing here. Um, yeah. I mean, the potential is so incredibly deep. Um, the, so the binding energy goes with mass squared, um, that, uh, and the feedback energy goes only linearly with mass. Of course, the IMF might become top heavy, so it goes somewhat super linear, but it's not like it cannot compensate the binding energy. And so it's likely that the gas just can't leave. Yeah? And it will just continue forming stars until supernova actually start exploding, if there's sufficient hierarchy of supernova, they, might, they would blow it out, I imagine. Uh, the fact that most globular clusters are not enriched in iron does seem to indicate, uh, or uh, enriched in supernova ejector, does seem to indicate that um, the uh, star formation stops before the supernova um, has been yeah. able to enrich. Yeah, so. yeah, there's actually measurements of, of that in, in, in objects that, that are more massive than Orion, but less massive than R136. And I'm talking about Sagittarius B2, W51, mm -hmm. W49, those objects. Uh, so with recent uh, ALMA and VLA surveys, there, there, are, there is evidence of, of what I'm telling that, that. So you have these very efficient, very efficient hops of star formation, but there's also an extended stellar population, no? That, that, that I don't know if its origin is is the expansion you're talking about because we are seeing these clusters at less than one mega year. No? So, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, we made, uh, let me, I'm not sure if I have the slides here. Um, here. So probably Orion is not the, uh, probably, yeah, the best. Nope. I had uh, slides where we looked at the revitalization re um, of these clusters, but I'm not sure if I have them. I uh, might have deleted them. Yeah. No, hang on. It might be... Because we looked at uh, what happens. So the things we match now, I, don't, I can't find them now. But um, so, so we did match um, clusters like um, R136, um, so exactly here. Uh, we, so ONC Pleiades works well. We, we looked at NGC 6103 at its age. We know it's morphology, so um, the distribution of, so we have this density, observed density profile. We have some indication of the kinemat kinematic uh, structure uh, and the same for R136. We have, of course, less data because it's much further away at 50 kiloparsecs and um, the n-body models which um, match these clusters at their age today started very compact and they went through the same, you know, through these same numbers. Um, so um, it's um, suggestive that the, they formed with a very similar star formation efficiency. Now they are still fairly low mass, even R136 of 10 to the 5 solar masses. I mean, it formed a huge number of massive stars, right? And, and they really, I mean, once an O-star starts shining, it's extremely destructive you know, to, the, um, to the molecular cloud. It just immediately um, ionizes the whole, you know, Strumgen sphere goes out to the speed of light and it stalls, of course, but then there are many stars who are doing the same thing and the whole thing just erupts. I mean, what else is the gas supposed to do, right? Um, and the potential well of even this class is not really so incredibly deep to really keep the gas there. So. It's difficult to see how such clusters, even at this fairly high end, would be able to have a substantially higher star formation efficiency, at least from my point of view. And I know there are people who say that uh, the star formation efficiency is basically 100%, yeah, but I just, I just fail to see how this is physically possible as soon as you have an O star, right? because the O star just destroys the whole cloud within an incredible short time. Um, unless it's extremely dense, but then you have many old stars, right? And then they move around and they eject each other and uh, yeah. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, Luis Felipe. 
I thank you. Your uh, cluster models that keep ejecting stars are very interesting. And I wanted to ask you if you sometimes get the simultaneous ejection of several stars or, uh, or this doesn't happen. And the, the question is, of course, because of Orion, BNKL, where you apparently have the ejection of uh, probably four or five stars at about the same time. Yeah, um, um, the, I'll just show, I'll show this movie here again, um, because um, here you can, uh, yes, yeah, so you see how many stars are being ejected? This is even a very massive star, and here is a multiple system. So this star is, consists of one, two, three, four, five. This is a quintuplet, a five star system, very compact, is thrown out of the cluster. Then it, um, um, I think one of the stars explodes. So then you have a massive star with a neutron star around it. And then the other one explodes, shooting off the neutron stars into this different direction. Let me just go back. Um, if I can, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, please, Silica. Uh, Divaka? Hello. Uh, Hello. So, my question also uh, is on this uh, escaping massive stars. So, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, I mean, there are clusters like uh, Western N1 and uh, R136, as you mentioned now. So they have a lot of massive stars. So, so how do they retain these massive stars in that case? That just like, oh, how many have escaped already? Yeah. 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 Something about that? Well, we, we, can, um, we can estimate the numbers uh, ejected, lost already, um, yeah. in, uh, but we haven't done that for those particular clusters. Um, but of course, some will, will always remain. Now oh, let me, um, yeah. So you see this um, um, plot here. Um, you can see um, that um, these clusters, so this is the fraction of O stars ejected. So one means all O stars are ejected from the cluster and 40% mm -hmm. um, means 40% have been thrown out of the cluster. So these clusters here don't have any O stars, so they can't eject any because they don't make any O stars. Mm -hmm. But then here, uh, one or two O stars appear, but here now you have a few O stars at this mass range and they eject O stars efficiently. But you see, as you go up to mass, like 10,000, 100,000 solar masses, the ejection fraction drops. So the cluster starts to keep more O stars. It's still ejecting more O stars than these clusters because the cluster is more massive, but it keeps a larger fraction of them because the potential is deeper and you need an always higher velocity to, to eject them. So um, um, you can see that in this case, at the uh, mass scale of 10,000 solar masses, typically about 20% uh, of the massive stars are rejected and 80% are therefore left in the clusters. Okay, so in, in massive clusters, you expect the, all the massive stars to be uh, intact? In, in the, in this well, it drops right? down, um, yeah, but, but the, the, the thing is that the total number of O stars ejected is still larger than in these low mass clusters because these clusters have many more O stars. And so the number increases. So although yeah. it, they eject a smaller fraction, they yeah. still eject more in total. Um, yes, yeah, so um, what we did, for example, I thought this was really interesting. In, the, in R136, we took the measured IMF, or you know, what has been published, yeah. and we corrected the IMF for the stars which were ejected because the cluster is about 2 million years old. So we can quantify the numbers ejected, add them back in, and it turns out that R136 must have formed with a slightly top-heavy IMF in order to explain the IMF we see today and the fact that it's, of course, uh, evolving still dynamically. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, Javier? So, thank you for, for the beautiful talk, uh, Pavel. Uh, well, now that is this plot in, in, in the screen, so what will be the mass in this case of, of Orion Nebula? Uh, here, the Orion is about a thousand solar masses, just okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but then uh, that, uh, I, I mean, I didn't understand in the first place why you didn't, um, uh, you, you rejected the, the idea of that different populations in a cluster will be a result of a, of, of a cluster being built up by different, uh, by the merging of, of smaller uh, subclusters. So I didn't get that. And then, 
So uh, it seems that you are uh, suggesting that for these intermediate mass clusters, the, the preferred mechanism will be that always you are rejecting the massive stars in, in short time scales. Is that so? Um, yes. So. Um the um if you look at this um slide here one you can see it right so um on 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 this plot this is um let me see i'm trying to read the uh, figure caption to just maybe enlarge this um yeah um forgotten forgotten how massive this was but this is of the range of about a thousand to ten thousand solar masses so the ONC would be not too different from this. So if the Orion Nebula cluster had formed from subclusters, um, it would not be so compact and smooth today. That's the problem. It, it completely lacks substructure. Uh, and um, I mean, substructure erases when um, these subclusters merge, but it takes time. It takes um, at least the um, um, phase mixing time in this, in, in, in this type of cluster. And, um, and that takes a few million years to really eradicate all the substructure if, if there was any. And so uh, there really is no room for um, these type of clusters to form from a merging of subclusters. It just doesn't work because of the time, time constraint uh, here. And um, um, the other problem is that if, if one forms the Orion Nebula cluster from many smaller clusters, then um, how would you make the massive star? Then you'd have to uh, believe that the IMF is a stochastic distribution function that you just by chance make a massive star or not. But this then leads you to into problems like saying that uh, you would form an O star basically in a vacuum. Yeah? And that's of course completely impossible because if you, if you consider the IMF to be a, a probability density distribution function, you will have the uh, events of forming single massive stars just here or there, uh, and um, and this is simply uh, not uh, not observed. I mean, all cases which have been claimed by some people to be evidence for massive stars which formed in isolation have gone away because they've all been shown to either have a bow shock, so it's actually moving, and then you go backwards and see that there's a cluster there, uh, or they have actually measured fairly high uh, velocities. Um, or they have a proper motion and it actually gets you back to a, a young cluster. Um, and so that actually, um, uh, there's no real, there's no significant evidence for that. And so the uh, probably the distribution function interpretation, I think doesn't work. And then, so if you start with these subclusters, then you would simply not be able to make a massive star in these because they don't have enough mass to make a massive star plus the whole subcluster, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, all of these different arguments, the timescale argument for the merging, plus what I've just said, um, all together um, have convinced me quite um, strongly that the type of clusters we see here, uh, like ONC, R136, are really uh, monolithic uh, forms. So the, the molecular cloud forms these filaments, they fall together probably from different, um, different filaments connecting. And there's so much mass influx in such a short time that then a stellar population builds up within a short time, within a fraction of a million years probably. And ionizing stars begin to ionize the structure and then stop star formation, not instantly of course, but within again something like 100,000, 200,000 years. And then the sh it's, it's finished, the cloud is just destroyed. And you can see it in the uh, 30 Dorados region where R136 has really destroying the whole cloud around it. Right? It's, it's an active process, it's continuing right now. Um, so, um, yeah, was that um, helpful, this answer? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, you know, um, we have simulations on, on, on this uh, kind of, of merging, so clusters. And my feeling, my, my first answer to this will be that, that uh, it may depend on the, on the initial conditions that you have, no? because in principle, we, sort of thing that in Kuznetsova et al. Uh, 15, 2015, uh, we have a kind of Orion Nebula cluster formed by uh, the merging of smaller clusters. Although the scales uh, are not the same, uh, probably we, are, we have a more compact, smaller region, initial region. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, um, I have to think a little bit on, on that. Well, of um, course, if, if, if you, um, because of the time scale problem, so the cluster is um, only, you know, two million years old overall, roughly, yeah? Um, 
if you want to form the whole cluster and have it smooth by two million years, you have to start your subclusters very compact yeah, together. And this is, of course, not excluded. Uh, so this is basically this argument here. If you make it very, very complex, you put the clusters very close together, then allow them to merge, then it would, in principle, work. But, um, yeah, it would still then overall be very similar to the uh, monolithic uh, description. So I, I wouldn't say it's entirely, totally monolithic only and exclusively, because um, you, you might, uh, you know, this is very realistic that you might just have subclusters very complex. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't refer to your paper. I just, um, I, I didn't have time to scan the whole literature on this problem. Um, apologies for that. No, that's should, good. Should be, uh, yeah. thanks, we have one final question from Enrique. Uh, hi, thanks. Thanks again. So, uh, yeah, still concerning this issue, um, as we found in the same paper that uh, you mentioned there, the 2017 paper, actually the massive stars, uh, we find that they take some time to appear. And that is because the clump that is forming them needs to grow and develop the appropriate conditions. So in that sense, I totally agree with you that the IMF is not just a probability distribution function. Uh, and in fact, um, what we find is that, the, that it builds up and develops the massive part at later times, so maybe a few million years apart. But so that would make me uh, wonder a little bit about this, uh, this uh, suggestion of, of the uh, expulsion of the first generation of massive stars and then having a second one. Uh, mm -hmm. What we are finding is that we also have like multi, multiple populations in, in our regions, but that is because the, the filamentary accretion onto the clump is actually uh, clumpy mm -hmm. itself. The filaments are clumpy. So could it be that uh, as the as the clump that is forming, the hub that is forming the stars is accreting from the filament, uh, these different uh, uh, generations could be due to bursty star formation activity due to bursty accretion. And I think the way to test that could be if the ages of, uh, say, if the mass distributions of the different generations were different uh, and so that the older ones could contain less massive stars because uh, they didn't have time to form stars yet. Um, I've been also wondering if you could have a clump which falls in. Uh, so basically what you're saying, uh, but mm -hmm. this again, the time scale of now, now if, if, you can, if you can find that you have this situation and within two million years you, found, you actually mm -hmm. form a well-defined nearly spherical in a region, mm -hmm. so within say two parsecs, Mm -hmm. cluster which um, is smooth, yeah? it, it doesn't actually have substructures in it, um, then, um, then that would be great. Yeah? But I, I'm not sure if that, that, that actually can be done. I don't know if you looked at the timescale arguments. Yeah, actually, in, in that paper, we, it, it's, it's interesting because I think we have like a combination of the two scenarios in, in that simulation. It's like, uh, because we have, um, and this is something that I would like to discuss separately, we, we talk about it as hierarchical, but I think it's, it's not hierarchical in the same way that you're saying it. So it's not as, as different. No, it, it's not as opposed or it's not as ruled out. Mm -hmm. and, and we, what we have is a hierarchy of forming objects because uh, we have several sites of star formation. There's a few ones that are sufficiently nearby that managed to fall into the clump during the, the, the first two couple of million years. The other ones are sufficiently far apart that they don't manage to fall into, mm -hmm. into the yeah. hub. Yeah. And uh, so, for example, we do have an episode in which the, the nearby cluster, in fact, it's right there in, in the images you showed, right? So in the upper, so you see in the, yeah. the upper right square, we have these two objects uh, and you see the separation is precisely like maybe one or two parsecs. And then in the next, uh, uh, time frame they have merged yeah. right mm -hmm. so that's one episode of merging but then there's other ones that never managed to merge uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and what's interesting is that the two objects that that managed to merge actually do contain both stars and gas so they could uh, at the same time combine two different populations and uh, and also enrich or enhance the star formation rate in the main hub 
and, and quite, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, the, um, that's quite viable. Um, the, um, one would have to then understand how, you, how the massive stars also form, right? So in my, um, in my view, I, I, I mean, the data, I see them telling us that the most massive star uh, correlates with the mass of the embedded cluster in which it forms. Uh, so one would have to take that somehow into account or maybe it comes out. Maybe the massive star actually then later forms. Yeah? Uh, as right. you suggested. But I think in your paper, you, you assume the IMF is a probability distribution function, so you just sort of... No, you, actually, no, we don't. In that paper, ah, okay. we okay. form... Uh, we have something that is intermediate between the uh, a random sampling of a distribution function and not. What we do, we do is a, what we have... But maybe, uh, you know, this is details, so perhaps we can continue this discussion privately and not keep the rest of the audience waiting. I don't know, soon there you tell us. Because, yes, uh, please, we, thanks, Enrique, because I think there are at least one more person has questions. So we'll move it to the okay, discussion okay, section. Perfect. Uh, okay. Let me just take this opportunity to thank Pavel again. We had 50 plus participants today. Thanks to your talk. So yeah, thank you very much. And thanks to Enrique thank for you. organizing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>